Good evening. Welcome. Glad to see you folks have weathered the storm and come out through the slush and the melting to join us tonight. My name is Linda Bowden, and I'm the volunteer state president for AARP Vermont. And we're thrilled to see all of you here tonight. We're hoping to get to know our Burlington City Council candidates a little better. These candidates are vying to represent voters like you in wards two and three. The livability of our communities has long been a focus of our work at AARP Vermont. How our cities and towns prepare for and accommodate an aging population has a profound effect on the health of a community and the quality of life today and in the future for residents of all ages. We hope to explore a number of critical issues, including transportation, housing, job growth, and mobility tonight, and give you the opportunity to ask your questions as well. We are fortunate tonight to partner with Burlington Business Association, who shares our commitment to educating voters like you on how these candidates stand on important livability issues before you go to the polls in March. We encourage you to ask questions of the candidates by filling out an index card. These can be found at the registration table along with pens. So please feel free at any moment to grab one or I'll be wandering around with other cards so you can get one from me. Please provide your name and your question and return it to me or the center up there by the table. We'll select as many as we can with the time that we have. If you need to know more about the candidates and their positions, I hope you got a program that was up on the table because their information is lit listed there. Our moderator tonight is Fran Stoddard. She is in charge tonight, folks. So she will ask the candidates questions and manage the format. She will outline the details in just a moment. Tonight's event is meant to be an educational forum. We ask all of you folks to please respect the spirit of this event as well as our candidates and audience members and refrain from any rallying, heckling, or loud cheering. We want to use our time efficiently and promise to get to as many questions as possible. And you're invited to a reception in the back uh, to meet the candidates and to mingle uh, after we finish with the questions. Before we go any further, I'd like to give a shout out to the many volunteers that we have working this event tonight. Thank you, we couldn't have done this event without you. We have many opportunities at AARP for volunteer efforts. You may have seen if you were around on the other side. Tax aid folks do work here, volunteer their time to help people with taxes. We have driver safety, we have fraud. Um, advocacy, livable communities, many different opportunities. AARP is active with lots of different things. So if you have questions about volunteering or want to get involved, see me. And I'd be more than happy to answer any of those questions. So at this point in time, I would like to introduce Fran Stoddard. Thank you, Linda. Okay, I'll let you know um, how we're gonna run this evening. Um, I think it's uh, at the desk, I hope all of you got one of these because uh, there aren't gonna be opening statements as there often are. Uh, there will be closing statements tonight, but their statement about who um, these um, three uh, candidates are, are in that pamphlet. So um, we are going to uh, do, I have questions. I will do them from here. The reason why we ask you to have questions on cards is it's much better for the people who are filming so RETN and Channel 3 can have a sense of those questions. Um, it just makes more sense. That's why we ask you to write them on cards and, and bring them up here. And we might even put together questions that are very similar to ask the candidates. Please know that, um, is it RETN or is it VCAM? I'm sorry, Channel 17, of course. Uh, so if people are missing this, they can, um, of course, see this on Channel 17. 
When uh, earlier tonight, the candidates drew a number, and that has created the order of today. So I will start with Brian and um, go down the line, and then the next question, um, I will start with Max, and then the third question with Ryan, et cetera, and go around, and that's how that's going to work. Each of them gets 60 seconds to answer the question, and if, there, if I have a follow-up, uh, yes, and we have a fabulous timekeeper here. Steve is going to keep them in line and let them know how much time they have. Uh, so they have 60 seconds. If I ask a follow-up, they get another 30 seconds each. If um, any of the candidates can choose to have a rebuttal, uh, and they have three rebuttal cards, and they will waive them if they want to use them, uh, but they just have three, so it's just kind of like timeouts. That, that's, that's a limit. Um, so um, that's what they get to use, and that will, the rebuttals will be a 30-second as well. And I think we are ready to go. Thank you again all for being here, and we hope you do encourage people to watch the video. So uh, the more people come out and really have a sense of what the issues are and where people are standing uh, is really important to you and this wonderful city. So I will start with the opening question, and we are going to start uh, with Brian. Like the rest of the state, Burlington's population is aging. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, over the next decade and beyond, the percentage of people 65 and older will grow more than any other age demographic. We keep hearing this. But interestingly enough, right behind older adults are people in their 20s. How can our city grow, develop, and redevelop in a way that addresses the needs, desires, and desires of these two demographics? So maybe you can name two changes you would support to address the needs of these two groups. Brian. Great, thanks Fran. And just to clarify, I have 60 seconds to give you this answer, do I? 60 seconds. All right, I'll read then, because I think it'll be a little quicker. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I believe that housing continues to be a major concern for this community for both younger and older residents. Uh, top priority for Burlington seniors is, is consistently expressed in surveys after surveys is being able to age in place. And um, I'm a strong supporter of the home sharing model as a way to do that. It's not the only way, but it's one way that from a public policy standpoint that we can help older people age in place while also opening up housing opportunities for others who are often younger people looking for affordable homes. So it's a great win-win as they say. Um, I believe the reality is we're with our aging population, the growth of this population, we'll never be able to build our way out of it uh, to meet the demands and to meet the needs. Um, and for many people, staying in their home is really the, their preferred choice and their best choice and more affordable and easier than downsizing. Uh, you hear a lot about downsizing, but it's not necessarily easy for everyone. So those are the, those are the ways I would try to address both ends of that spectrum. Fantastic. And um, I was remiss. Um, Brian Pine, of course, is the incumbent uh, from Ward 3. He is uh, in the Progressive Party. Um, and um, I'm not taking up uh, your time, um, Max, but just to make sure everybody knows who's here. Yep. Um, Max is also an incumbent and uh, the Progressive and from Ward 2. And also coming uh, new to this uh, forum, uh, Democrat Ryan Nick, also from Ward 2. So that's who we have here tonight. That would be important to let everybody know. So next up is Max Tracy, the progressive. So um, this is, and also they have seen this opening question and the others um, they have not seen. So again, um, on to Max uh, about how you would deal with these two different demographics that we have in this area. Absolutely. Well, like Councilor Pine, I absolutely agree that housing is, an, is a crucial issue for our community and making sure that people have uh, the ability to age in place um, or to age in a place of their choosing. And I think that that's a, a, a crucial challenge that we face uh, here in Burlington. Um, what I think that we see, um, or what I hear as I go around the neighborhood, is that um, a challenge to that is making sure, is people having the ability to continue to keep up with the tax burden. Um, so I think that there's a, a need to continue to, uh, to budget in a way that's fair, that maintains city services, but also that keeps taxes uh, in a way, it keeps taxes reasonable. So I think that the way that we can do that is looking towards more progressive streams of revenue that have uh, wealthier folks paying more. This is not really something that's built into our 
our current property tax model, and I think we absolutely have to address that. I think it's not just about that, though. I think it's also about expanding different housing options, and I am in support of the accessory dwelling unit policy currently before the City Council, allowing us to um, potentially create um, what have traditionally been known as in-law apartments uh, adjacent to, um, to existing units. So I think housing is a huge aspect of the, the age in place as well as this new demographic. Great. Thank you, Max. And Ryan. Got it? Yeah, I think so. Um, so I, I think, you know, we need to make housing more available for seniors. Um, you know, I agree to some extent with the sentiment that we can't build our way out of the problem. But, you know, we have a lot of aging folks in, you know, these one family homes, uh, you know, with stairs in them, multiple bedrooms, space that they don't really need anymore. Um, and, you know, I've heard from many community members that if housing was available, they might choose to downsize. Um, which would be great because then it would free up a home for a new family uh, coming into town. But we also need to pair that with uh, workforce uh, development. Uh, Burlington needs to bring new jobs and new businesses into our city so that you know, young people, uh, the other demographic that's growing here, um, can support the tax base and the growing tax burden on Burlington residents. Great, thank you very much. Um, you might have noticed there is theater going on upstairs. It's a very vibrant community center. <laughs> So, um, but fortunately we have these microphones and hopefully that helps everybody hear okay. Um, we will move on to the questions. These questions were developed by AARP and uh, the Burlington Business Association. So if you're wondering where these questions came from, they have really worked hard on, uh, on questions that are really important uh, to the city. The next one is on housing. The city is currently proposing removing the minimum parking requirement for new development in the downtown and transit corridors. What are your views on how this change will help promote affordable housing? And we'll, we're gonna start with Max, thank you. So in, in terms of, I, I do support the, the idea of removing the parking minimum requirement. I think that this is an important step towards um, making um, it more af towards more de towards uh, having uh, more affordable uh, development, and I think and that just has to do with the fact that it costs a lot to, to build a structured parking space. I believe it's I've heard around around forty thousand dollars per space, uh, so it's quite expensive. I think that the key to that, though, is not just removing parking, but also crafting the ordinance in a way um, that that not only removes that requirement and the costs associated with that, but actually um, gets us because that's a huge savings to developers, and I don't think that we should be giving that all away or allowing them to take that benefit. I think what we need to do is instead of that requirement, if people aren't going to build the parking, to make sure that we actually have them contribute to additional resources, so uh, more sustainable transportation, um, walking, biking, and uh, better funding our transit system uh, and transit resources for seniors. Thank you. Ryan. Um, I think that's a, a good point, and I would also agree with uh, removing the parking minimums, especially our, along transit corridors. Uh, I think that could also be paired with uh, increasing the density along bus routes and major transit areas uh, in the city, where, you know, in order to increase ridership on these transit routes and bus routes, um, it'd be helpful if people live next to them and within walking distance, so people could get from their houses to their grocery store to, you know, the community center, what have you. Um, you know, I think charging landlords for you know the parking that they're not providing uh it would be nice if they could contribute maybe uh like parking impact fees in south burlington um, but we need, just need to make sure that those fees are set at an appropriate level so that it doesn't limit uh, new development great thank you brian we probably share a lot of opinions on these issues, so it may sound a little redundant, but I'll try. Uh, the, um, I think the idea of a parking or transit impact fee um, has a lot of merit, as, um, as Max said, that it is a cost that is borne by somebody. If parking is not borne by, uh, the cost of parking is not borne by a developer, it falls on either the tenant because they need a place to park, or they then need to basically pay for transit. So I think there's a, there's a trade-off there that we need to be uh, mindful of and be sure that we're right-sizing it so that uh, there will be just enough parking to meet the need and no extra parking built, and that the savings somehow accrue to the, to the benefit of the, of the residents and to the community at large. Uh, ultimately, parking minimums in a downtown like Burlington will become obsolete. Uh, the market will determine what's needed, and over time, you know, as we transition away from uh, dependence on fossil fuel, hopefully we will see uh, much more options for people that are uh, affordable and viable. 
there's a follow-up question um, that, that the organizers wanted, and, and you've kind of, some of you have, have sort of addressed this, but would you support further expanding this minimum parking requirement in residential and lower density areas? Does it make sense there as well? And, and we're gonna go with Max again and go around, just, just a quick uh, 30 seconds or less. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth looking at. I think we should start with the with the downtown and the the more dense areas, and then sort of branch off of that and continue to and see how it see how it goes. But I think it's something that that has merit and that is part of what I think is a reconsideration of how we use space in our community. Um, that is necessary not only in terms of sort of the changing demographic trends that we see and the changing mm -hmm. needs, but also in terms of the climate crisis and our need to really move away from uh, fossil fuel dependence and building that infrastructure into our communities in such a in, in such a concrete, literally concrete way. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would support uh, changing it along transit corridors, uh, not necessarily in neighborhoods per se, where you know people more have single family homes and we wanna preserve the scale and character of the neighborhoods. Um, but certainly, and I think they're pretty clear, you know, transit corridors, what we're talking about. Um, so I support it along those. Thank you, Ryan. I'm open to it. I, I want us to, you know, be honest about having this be a transitionary period that we're in or a transitional period, moving away from over-dependence on uh, the automobile and on fossil fuels. Single occupancy automobiles are um, something we're going to look back on and say, I can't believe we drove around as single people sitting in those hunks <laughs> of steel burning that much fossil fuel. But we're not there yet. So I think we need to be mindful of that and recognize that some neighborhoods um, are traditionally places where uh, parking is really a, an amenity that people depend on. So let's be aware of that. Okay, terrific, thank you. Uh, Ryan, we're gonna start with you on, on a land use and development question. Are the policy changes that you feel are necessary to address the downtown mall pro project to ensure, are there policy changes that you feel are necessary to address the downtown mall project to ensure completion? I think that's a really interesting question because I'm not entirely sure there are policy changes that the city could make to, you know, I, I think we need to work with the developer, hold them accountable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'm not sure like there are policy changes that could be made uh, going forward. You know, we can look at upcoming projects differently. We can hold them to different standards, um, but I'm not sure what a resolution would look like for that. Uh, I do think the city does need to prioritize opening up the streets, uh, St. Paul and Pine, hmm. to increase walkability, bikeability, and connectivity in the city. Okay, great. And Brian, and, and um, is Steve Griffin sitting in a good place for all of you to see him? Would you rather he was right here in front of Marcus, maybe? Not to make it a big deal, but just so you aren't, yeah, yeah, yeah you're looking kind of two different yeah. ways. Okay, so now we will begin with Brian around this, this land use and development, um, this, these policy changes around the project. Could I use a rebuttal card to just ask you to rephrase the question or say it again? Cause I, you don't need the rebuttal. <laughs> there, are there policy changes that you feel are necessary to address the downtown mall project to ensure its completion? I think that's pretty hard because we're in the middle of the stream, if you will, and I think it's um, important to have a certain level of predictability and certainty in our local regulatory process. So I'm not sure that policy changes at this point would serve the community that well, I, I have to admit. I don't want, and I don't think our community wants to see a vacant hole in our downtown for any longer than necessary. So. I believe our focus now is how to move forward and preserve the benefits and the amenities that came with that project and ensure that, um, that it be done in a way that um, you know, upholds our, our values as a community, uh, our land use goals, and um, I'm gonna continue to, to advocate for, for that project going in that way. Thank you. So as someone who didn't support the mall moving forward and um, has been uh, advocating for uh, continuously accountability on the part of the developer. I think that part of the change is that we really need to, whenever we're being asked, part of, you know, I sort of take this question a little bit differently because we were told that we needed 14 stories in order for this project to have viability. Now we found that actually um, the 14 stories were what made it not happen. Uh, and so I think we need to, whenever we're considering making changes uh, requested by developers, really hold them to account, really dig deeper into those questions because what we're finding is that uh, in the case of the mall, that those, those 
promises and the, those, those claims just were not true. So I look more towards the mall project as needing to be one where we have more accountability mechanisms built in and specifically more public engagement and transparency around the project, making sure that folks have ability to weigh in on what is ultimately a very different project than they might have voted for uh, in the context of those requested policy changes. Terrific, thank you. Another one on governance and taxes, and know that we'll get to your questions in about 10 minutes or so. On this year's town meeting day ballot, voters will see two questions asking for their approval to increase taxes. These are proposed, these are a proposed increase of the housing trust fund assessment to a full penny, as well as a 0.3 cent increase in the public safety tax rate. What are your views on these tax increases, which are likely to result in higher housing costs? How would you address the concerns of our older and younger citizens who already say they cannot afford living costs in Burlington? We'll start with Brian. Thank you. The, uh, I do support both of the questions. Uh, increasing the housing trust fund is something that is long overdue. Uh, a uh, recent analysis of what the housing trust fund is, a city funding source that comes from the taxpayer and is then allocated to support the creation or preservation, rehabilitation of permanently affordable housing. It's only available to entities that, that, that perform that function for permanently affordable housing. So it's not a source of funding that goes to private developers. It goes to uh, nonprofit uh, public purpose developers. So I think that's really important. The public safety tax, uh, as much as I actually really dislike the property tax as the way to fund municipal services, we only have so many options available to us. So I still support it. I think we need to constantly look at ways to keep our costs, to improve efficiency of city government, and to ensure that we only raise our taxes when absolutely necessary. Okay, and Max. Yeah, so I support both of the, the, the housing trust fund tax as well as the public safety tax. I think it's important that we restore it to a full penny. In our conversation at the Charter Change Committee, which is the committee I chair, we talked about trying to bring a, a different progressive means of taxation into that. Unfortunately, um, that's really challenging, and I think we're going to have to continue that conversation to look for ways to get folks who are making more to pay more and to kind of deal with that, per, that issue of regressivity on the property tax side of things with that, but I think it's important that we restore to a full penny and adopt this because that will this, this change will mean that it keeps up with inflation. On the public safety tax, I also support that, and I think it's a crucial issue for seniors. Uh, one, one thing that we're seeing is uh, what this tax will do is allow us to add eight firefighters and an ambulance in the new North End. Currently, the ambulance from the old North End serves the new North End, uh, creating response time issues. With so many senior facilities in the new North End, we need to prioritize response times, and this will help us to do that and bring necessary resources to address that, while also freeing up uh, that ambulance or making sure that, that ambulance is available to respond to calls in the old North End and the other parts of the city as well. Thank you, and Ryan. Uh, not to sound repetitive, but I also support both of the measures. Um, I think you got a good description of what both of the taxes are by uh, Brian and Max, but I'm gonna choose to use this time to emphasize the fact that you know, our tax base is only so large, and you know, if a city of 40,000 people, the taxes are going to keep going up just as you know, cost of living, that's the way things work, for better or for worse. Um, if we don't increase our tax base, if we don't increase the population and the workforce of Burlington, um, you know, these taxes are going to continue to rise on residents and make it more unaffordable to live here. Thank you. We're going to move now to transportation and mobility, uh, and we'll start with Max this time. What is your strategy to make transit a practical daily option for a wide range of Burlingtonians and to assure it will be accessible for everyone? Sure. So um, one of the things that we've recently seen is that uh, Green Mountain Transit has rolled out their next gen planning. And I think that um, one thing that we need to do is address what has been a three to four percent decline in ridership as a result um, of some of the headway issues that they've had. So addressing those headway issues and making sure that people have uh, that buses are on time and that the headways are on time. We also need to make sure that the system is understandable for folks. The transition from numbers to, to colors was not well managed. And so they've added since added back in the numbers 
in addition to the colors. This is something that we really need to make sure we, we prioritize. I think that there's also uh, room to, to grow in terms of the app and, and some of the signage at the bus station as well. And then the city, I supported a resolution at the city council to explore creating additional fare-free transit routes. I heard from lots of seniors on the College Street shuttle um, that they wanted to see that remain a fare-free transit route because they relied on that to get between hospital appointments and their homes. I support that, but I also support us continuing to prioritize and looking at creating additional fare-free options for folks so that everybody can, can have access to this crucial community resource. Thank you, Max. And Ryan, your strategy for transit. Sure. Uh, I think the city council should look at a pilot program that runs about two years where we increase the service from every 20 minutes, which it is now, to about every 10 minutes. Um, which, you know, if you miss a bus and it's 20 minutes until the next one, like, your day is thrown off. Um, like, you know, now you're not going to get to the grocery store, you're going to miss your doctor's appointment. Um, and, you know, if you've missed the first bus of your day, like, it's not going to go well. Uh, so I think we should explore, you know, making it every 10 minutes. This would also increase ridership, um, you know, because I think I bike to work, but if on a day like today, I'd probably rather not. Um, if the buses were coming every 10 minutes, I could more easily catch one and would more consider taking one. Um, I guess that would be my specific policy proposal, um, but I also think that we should look at, you know, reducing fares for seniors and people who can't afford it. Thank you. And Brian? Sure. The, um, the transit system that works best is the one that comes most often and is uh, taking you to the places you need to go, first and foremost. And our system is, um, I think, inadequate in that regard for many people in many neighborhoods. And so uh, that is true for people in the old North End and folks in the new North End. And so we really need to have a more focused discussion, I believe, on increasing uh, the frequency uh, and also actually addressing the routes, because I think that's where the ridership we would start to see the numbers increase. And that's my emphasis. I'm cautiously open-minded about the idea of fare-free transit, but I don't want to cripple the entity that we're trying to grow with the fare, by cutting the fare out of the budget. I know it's only 17% of the overall revenue, but it's still a piece of the revenue picture. And if we cut that out, what are we doing to our goals to increase ridership? And there, there's a special question for, for your ward um, or your district here, which is how to balance the needs of all users, residents, and businesses along the Winooski Avenue corridor. So your, your thoughts briefly on that. And Ryan, we'll start with you on this one. Sure, thank you. Um, I think North Winooski Avenue over the past 10, 20 years has seen a lot of changes. We've seen a lot of new businesses come into town um, with Jake's Old North End Market just opening the other day. Um, and it's in clear need of redoing uh, in some form, way, shape, way or shape. You know what I meant. Um, anyways, I do think that right now the proposal is to take away 110 parking spaces between Riverside and Pearl Street. Um, and I think the idea is that we're going to study the parking and the parking management plan is going to come back and tell us there are empty spots here and there. But those empty spots are in front of houses and they're for residents. The cars, if we take away the parking spaces tomorrow, the cars are not going to stop coming at least for a certain amount of time. The cars are going to still come and they're going to park in front of houses. Um, that is where residents park. And, you know, it'll, I think these businesses are also run on like a very thin margin um, and that, you know, we've seen a lot of revitalization around the area and I would be wary of messing that up too much. Thank you. Brian. Yeah, this is an issue that I think uh, we still have work to do as a community. At the Neighborhood Planning Assembly uh, a couple of months ago, I sort of jokingly said, can't we do both? Can't we have our cake and eat it too? And I still hold out the hope that we can figure out a way to do both, and that is accommodate the need for a continuous, safe bike lane, uh, but also have uh, residents, many of whom are working class and low-income renters, living in the buildings have access to parking that they really need for a lot of uh, people to maintain their employment and their independence. So I, I want to make sure we've thought about all the players, all the stakeholders when we're doing uh, this project. And I think south of Pearl is pretty straightforward. I don't know. I think you might have referred to North Minsky, but I just want everyone to know that the, the improvement south of Pearl, I think, enjoy broad support at the council and in the community, and I think it would be a great improvement. I know there are some in the business community who are very concerned about that, and I think we need to be mindful of their, their caution and their concerns, but at the same time, we really need to address the fact that you can't safely navigate downtown Burlington on a bike on a continuous uh, path through downtown Burlington. We need to deal with that. Hey, Max. 
So I think that we need to revolutionize our transportation system. I again say that we are in climate crisis. The city council adopted a resolution moving us towards a net zero framework. We've continued to adopt climate action plans. We adopted a climate crisis resolution, but we have not seen enough action specifically around getting people out of cars and providing alternatives to car transport. And so what I think that we need to do is prioritize the implementation of Plan BTV Walk Bike, which is the, a vision, would set forth a vision for creating a, a comprehensive world-class network for walking and biking in the city. Winooski is a crucial corridor in the building out of that network in the sense that it's a street that goes uh, throughout uh, the city from north to south. I think that I fully support the four to three conversion in the downtown section, so going from uh, having, f going to have two, char two car travel lanes, a center turn lane and bike lanes in that section. And then I also support going through a parking management study to understand how we can better manage that parking. But I think that to assume that it's gonna turn out negative, um, we need to make sure that we approach this in a way that um, is um, embracing of that need to change and also is open-minded, giving us a chance to really think that this may actually benefit uh, the city and businesses in ways that we might not have imagined because we're so car-centric in our thinking. So I think we need to open up our minds and try out new, new strategies for getting... Thank you, Matt. Awesome. And uh, land use. Uh, two more questions for me and then we'll get to your questions. Uh, there is a debate in many cities across the country over diversity versus sprawl. Proponents of higher density point to the environment, housing, livability, and economic benefits. Should city policies aim to increase density in some areas of the city? How should the city strike a balance between preserving neighborhood character and promoting density? And we'll start with Brian. Sure, this, this issue is one that uh, Burlington has only begun to grapple with. I think that there uh, was recognition in our, our conversations around how to improve the one ordinance that really dictates what happens around affordable housing in relation to market rate housing was around inclusionary zoning. And in that process, the, the task force of really smart people sat around and said, you know what we have? We actually have a city that's zoned to exclude multifamily and affordable housing in whole sections of our city. We did not raise that issue because that was not the task we were charged with. But that was a recognition that everyone at the table had after months of looking at this issue was, if we don't grapple with the fact that we, as a city, if we're going to grow, have to be willing to look at increased density all over the city, I think we're gonna be cutting ourselves short on our potential. And that relates to things like increasing our transit, because density is what leads to good transit. Robust transit depends on density, so I think we need to be open-minded about this in every neighborhood. And Max? So I, I guess I think about neighborhood character not just in terms of buildings, but actually neighborhood characters and people who are in neighborhoods, and I think that we need to give people the resources that they need to stay in their neighborhoods, and I think that what we've seen is that, um, you know, I've seen actually this happen quite a bit in the neighborhood, is that, you know, for instance, I was talking with someone about who uh, wanted to stay in the neighborhood and was hoping to develop an affordable uh, unit as uh, along with a friend and so I think uh, an accessory dwelling unit that is and so I do support um, the accessory dwelling unit uh, ordinance I think that that can help us to balance that need for neighborhood character while also getting us an, that additional density in a responsible way. Um, I think that um, we're doing it in, I think that we do need to address some, ad, some questions that still are outstanding, specifically um, an impediment that exists uh, with regards to fire code. We need to continue to look at that because that $10,000 to put in a sprinkler system can be prohibitive, or at least that's what I heard in this particular senior's case is that they weren't able to do the um, do the ADU because the, 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 the fire sprinkler system cost was, was so high. So I think that we need to do as much as we can to get people um, uh, the ability to stay in the neighborhood. Thank you, and Ryan. So I also support the ADU thing, but I think it's not enough. Um, it's a great policy, all for it. But you know, we really need to increase the density, particularly within our downtown core. Um, I think we're really underutilizing that area, and it could be a lot more dense, which will lead to the transportation benefits, the business benefits. You know, if you have enough people living in the downtown, then you could take away the parking. You would have enough people within there to create that sort of critical mass to support all these amenities, these stores, groceries, parks, um, and that they would create the sort of environment that would support all Burlingtonians. Um, so I think we really need to, particularly in the downtown core and on transit corridors, because yeah, I think a lot of people like the character of their neighborhoods. It's one of the reasons I live in the Old North End. Um, so I wouldn't want to disturb that too much, but I think we need to seriously consider uh, adding a lot of density in our downtown core. Great, thank you. 
And economic development and job growth. Um, what is your plan to help retain and grow new businesses in Burlington? We'll start with Max. Yeah, so I think that one of the things that we need to do is um, you know, engage with, with businesses and see what their needs are. And so I think that one of the things that we need to do is have, I think that one of the opportunity costs that we've seen is that's taken place as a result of focusing too much on sort of these large scale developments like the mall is that that saps resources from important economic drivers like our CETO office. For instance, you know, I think I read an article where and heard that the CETO director was spending as much as 50% of their time just on the city place project. And I think there's an opportunity cost in terms of supporting neighborhood scale businesses and making sure that they can thrive. So I think that we need to bring the focus back to the old north end, making sure that we're supporting the existing businesses because I think we're at a very crucial moment where we have a, an interesting mix of existing businesses that I think need support and then lots of new businesses coming in. And I think that we need to maintain that balance um, through aggressive uh, you know, engagement from CETO and making sure that we're engaging with them while also listening to them around uh, necessary policy changes on things like um, the business personal property tax, which the council listened to businesses and repealed in order to help those businesses continue to grow and invest. Thank you. Ryan. So I think first off, the city needs an economic development plan. Um, I think that the CEDO office should prepare one and that we should study what the city needs to develop our economy uh, to really become a fully 21st century city, which will help not only with jobs and the tax base, as previously mentioned, but also turning our city you know, more environmentally friendly. Um, we need to combine that with making the permitting and development process clear um, right now, especially for small developers. Like The big firms can handle it, but the one-offs, the tiny, small businesses, you know, they really need clarity in these areas because you know, they have their actual jobs to do. Um, and finally, I think that sort of economic development often gets too put on these big building projects, construction projects. Whereas I think we need to turn the focus from buildings and you know, stories and whatever to people and the workforce um, and just sort of the community as opposed to these uh, you know, more structural things, focus on the community. Brian. I uh, was involved in an effort <clears throat> previously called Jobs and People, which was an economic development strategy. And uh, a couple of years ago was able to get funding in the budget. The project never moved forward because the Community and Economic Development Office didn't have the capacity, just didn't have the people to implement it. So there's still funding that's sitting there to do a Jobs and People update. Jobs and People looks at what do we have available to people today for building a career ladder to uh, um, achieve their full goals, their full potential, you know, often called a pathway to the middle class, but I don't want to assume that's everyone's desire. But we ought to give people the resources and the tools so that they can, in fact, achieve their full potential and workforce development, connecting with our high schools, making sure that what we're doing at our tech center actually speaks to the needs of employers, especially higher paying employers, ensuring that as we develop a more tech oriented economy, that it doesn't result in us just recruiting employees from outside of Vermont to fill those jobs, but in fact serves local people. Right, Max. Oh, you started, <laughs> caught me. Okay, we're going to start this one. <laughs> it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a follow-up. Um, and now on to some of your questions. Um, in this one, what are your thoughts on balancing housing needs with environmental concerns, especially storm water management and lake health? And we're going to start with Ryan. Great, thank you. Um, I think with the housing, you know, I've previously stated that, you know, adding density will encourage bus use, bike use, um, and lessen our dependence on cars. So I don't think we should discount that. Um, I think with uh, particularly the larger projects with the mall, we need to make sure that they're treating all of the stormwater that comes off of it and goes, like, not directly into the lake. But we need to make sure uh, these projects, uh, especially in the dense downtown core where, we, you know, you don't have a lawn to absorb all of your stormwater. You need to make sure that this is treated um, properly before it gets to the lake, uh, because it's one of our biggest assets in the city of Burlington, and I would be remiss if we didn't do all that we could to protect it. Brian? I've always uh, subscribed to the notion that smart growth, which is inherently an environmental agenda, is fundamentally about rebuilding your downtowns and rebuilding your, your neighborhoods in a way that uh, encourages growth and development on underutilized properties. It looks for every opportunity uh, in an urban setting. At the same time, we have 
um, recent projects which as a result of new development is actually uh, improving late conditions over what was there previously. I know it's a little hard for folks to to fathom the idea that new development actually can improve uh, water quality, but what was there previously did nothing to treat water on site. And as Ryan said, treating your stormwater on site is the most effective way to reduce runoff and pollution into our lake. So that is embedded in a lot of our um, development codes. It's incentivized and developers are increasingly developing on-site solutions to stormwater. And that is a single, that's a huge game changer. They think a lot of folks have overlooked when they look at new development and think, oh, that must be dumping uh, more stormwater into the lake. It doesn't, it actually reduces that. Hmm. Great, Max. So I fully supported the uh, the water bonds that came to my committee, the Transportation Energy Utilities Committee, and I fully supported that. I went and toured the, the wastewater facilities to understand how that implementation is going and uh, get a real sense of how our water system is treated. One of the things I think on a neighborhood scale that we need to continue to do and that's been cited uh, as having helped us to deal with some of the, the outfalls. So we have a number of outfalls, one of which is uh, into the intervale, and when the combined sewer overflows, when we get these massive storms that we're seeing with greater frequency, again, because of climate crisis, um, we see those go off. What we've seen, though, is that those events have decreased as a result of the implementation of stormwater gardens at the neighborhood scale. And you can achieve a dual benefit of, deal of slowing that stormwater by inst installing more rainwater gardens while also uh, achieving a traffic calming benefit, so getting people to drive slower on neighborhood streets through those, those bump outs. I think it's also important that as we look at um, trying to uh, regulations uh, aimed at imp increasing density that we hold the, the bar high in terms of environmental standards. I did not support the, fair b the form based code because it did not go far enough in terms of environmental regulation or requirement. So I think we absolutely need to hold them accountable um, to that and hold it to a high standard if we're giving them benefits. Thank you. Uh, we'll start with Brian on this one. With about 12,000 seniors in Burlington, how would you improve walkability so that folks can age in place? Improve sidewalks, maintenance and snow plowing, safe crossings, et cetera, and make sure we can afford all that as well. Sure, I think the condition of our sidewalks is not really uh, what it should be in the neighborhood level, both in terms of the actual maintenance of the infrastructure, but also the removal of, of snow. Uh, anyone who's on the council today gets co contacted by one particular constituent to remind us to, to keep this issue front and center, and that is critical, that it is the um, need or the ability of folks to be able to navigate our sidewalks. Folks who, yesterday I was going, leaving my street, and I noticed someone in a wheelchair who literally was stuck in the snow on the sidewalk, and I needed to be somewhere. Fortunately, a neighbor was out with a shovel, and I told them that this person needed help. I mean, it was literally that. Um, we used to have an effort in the city that was volunteer driven, run out of City Hall called the Operation Snow Shovel that actually helps seniors get their homes shoveled out. It's something that I think we should revisit and get back to helping neighbor, neighbors helping neighbors. Thank you. Max. I think that we need to continue the increased investment that we've had in sidewalks. It used to be that we do about one mile of sidewalk a year. We've, uh, in, in recent years, as the implementation of the sustainable infrastructure plan has gone forward, we've been doing about three miles of sidewalk a year. I think we need to continue that. Uh, we've seen re the replacement rates be anywhere between 90 and 100 years for each square. I think we're getting to a point, though, where we've done a lot of the, the bigger sections, and now we need to go back and really focus on those really troublesome individual squares or really do a reassessment of the existing resource is to understand that. I'm also in favor of uh, dealing with intersections that have strange geometry and trying to create bump outs so that we shorten up those crosswalk distances. I think it's also important to, to take another look at signalization to make sure that people um, with mobility challenges have enough time to cross. Um, and I think that it's important to, in so doing these things, uh, prioritize quick build uh, technology or quick build strategies that allow us to get these safety improvements on the ground try them, test them, and if they work, uh, make them permanent, but not to wait to, to, to see a safety benefit when it comes to um, improving those crosswalks and sidewalks for folks. Okay, and Ryan, your thoughts on walkability? Well, I think uh, particularly in recent days, uh, we need to, uh, I don't know how you do this, but coordinate the plowing uh, on the sidewalks, because you know the sidewalk plow will come through in the morning, and then your driveway plow will come through, and now you can't get uh, onto your sidewalk unless you walk over like a three foot mound of very icy and unforgiving snow. Um, I also think that, you know, with the maintenance of the sidewalks, it's not so much that we need to, we do need to replace full sections of sidewalk and, you know, make sure that that effort is continuing and improved. 
But I think we also need to take a look at the C Click Fix app um, and the way of reporting these like sort of localized problems. So that you know, even if this section of sidewalk isn't due to be replaced for another five years, you know, you can be like, look, this route is growing up right here and needs attention. Um, I've tried to educate uh, some you know people of how to use C Click Fix. Uh, it's not the most user friendly thing, um, and so I think if we can make that process simpler, um, I think that would be, go a long way to helping walkability. Thank you, Ryan. And Max would like to take advantage of his rebuttal. Yeah, so I just want to make sure that um, I, I agree on that, and I'm already doing that in terms of the uh, the coordination. On Friday, I went out with the DPW plow driver and drove around. Um, first, I want to just thank our drivers for the great work that they're doing. I think they're unsung heroes in our community, and I think that they deserve to be lauded um, for their efforts, especially when you get these big storms. I think the big storms like this create challenges and uh, around plowing. Like when we get a lot of snow like that, they have to switch out the plows for actually the lowers and those take a lot longer so I think we need to coordinate those and then we also as we build more complete streets make sure that we're um, including those drivers in those conversations around how we build that infrastructure out appropriately thank you max okay on to another uh, possibly a quick may, maybe not a quick question um, and we'll start with max would you support a higher housing trust fund rate beyond the current proposed um, penny increase at what rate and why so um, we did look at uh, a, an additional um, cost or a, look at a two cent option uh, mm -hmm. at the Charter Change Committee. Uh, we felt that given all the different burdens, all the different needs that we were asking for, you know, things like the, this public safety tax at the same time, that uh, as well as the $100 million between the, school, uh, the schools and the water, that we should try and get it back to a penny, see what we're able to do with that. And then my feeling is that, again, going back to this, is that we need to continue to look for additional progressive revenue streams uh, in order to take that burden off of uh, you know those lower and more moderate income taxpayers. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, I think we need to fund the housing trust fund at appropriate levels. Um, I do think that I agree with this one cent tax raise, but you know, I think we need to look at the burden that we're placing on residents of Burlington, uh, homeowners and renters alike. Uh, how much and why is a difficult question, um, but I think. More importantly, we need to look at why the cost of housing is so expensive, why it's so expensive to build, why it's so expensive to live in, um, and really sort of address those problems. Um, you know, the Housing Trust Fund is a great tool in our toolbox for affordable housing. Um, but that being said, I think it's treating more the symptom than the cause. Thank you. Brian. Yeah, the, uh, <clears throat> my role with the city as the housing director at CEDO for 17 years taught me that it's all the above. We can't say one versus the other versus the other. But in the case of the Housing Trust Fund, it has essentially been frozen at about 200,000 in annual revenue. That's total annual revenue since 1990. It was created by a vote uh, in 1990. It, it has leveraged, even at this rate, for every dollar spent, it has leveraged between 35 and 40 additional public and private dollars to create affordable housing that otherwise uh, would not be created. And I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of the homes that have been created are serving people who could never get their needs met through the market. And it's just important to remember there is a market that doesn't work for a vast, large number of people. And if we, if we, need, if we want to keep people from falling into homelessness, we need to be serious about our commitment to that. And I think funding affordable housing at the local level uh, with state and federal dollars and private dollars is that, is that path. All right. And uh, one last question here. Max, you answered that last one. So on to Ryan. Okay. Um, full circle. So how would you make it easier to build new housing and make housing projects more cost effective for developers so that we can really expand our housing options? And we'll start with Ryan. I think that starts with clarifying the permitting process. Um, as I mentioned before, like the big firms, like they have people dedicated to these projects. Like, they, they, like their only job when they show up in the morning is to get the permit through, um, and to go before the you know various city boards, um, all of which have a point and a purpose. Um, and I don't think their you know usefulness should be discounted. Um, but we need to make the process clearer. Um, it's often difficult, especially for these small developers, uh, to navigate uh, the process if you're unfamiliar with it. Um, I think 
the small developers also, you know, we, we need to prioritize them in, a, in the city. Because if you, if you own 100 units, then like one bad unit isn't going to be, you know, you can probably fall asleep fairly easily at night. But if you have five units and you have one bad unit, like that's someone you know. You know their first name, you know their last name, you know their kids' names. Um, and, you know, you just, you care a lot more about it and it's, it's a lot more representative of who you are um, and the quality of the unit that you own. So I think if we can help the small time developers out, that would go a long way. Thank you, Brian. Sure, drawing back to my CEDO days, I would say that uh, part of the role that I was able to play because we had a diversity of funding and we had enough staff was to be that kind of development ombudsperson for developers of all sizes. So part of that role was basically sitting down with developers and explaining the process, helping them through the uh, affordability requirements because that was primarily what we were charged with, but also providing assistance around uh, issues of, of ensuring that they uh, make them the properties fully um, accessible and that uh, public transit be considered um, and that, you know, the whole range of development issues, it, it's a really appropriate role for the city to play uh, to help people through the process. We have addressed the process somewhat, but I think, um, I think Ryan does raise an important point as a city, you know, that's one of our tools is to regulate development and we need to continue to do that, but do it in a way that's fair, predictable, and, you know, relatively timely in the way that we uh, review development. And Max. So I've been a supporter of the permit reform efforts, uh, specifically the combination of and the streamlining of uh, bringing the offices together down at Pine Street. That was a huge issue. And I think that that's really more geared towards, um, you know, sort of smaller people trying to do work on their houses. I think that with the boom that we've seen in development take place, I'm not so sure that it's that hard to do development in Burlington. We have a lot that's taking place in recent years. Uh, we're in, a, in the midst of a, of a building boom. And I think that moving towards more of a buy right development uh, strategy, so taking the DRB out of it, um, as we, uh, as the council chose to do, that, but that I voted against, um, because of those, the lack of, of strong enough environmental provisions uh, that address that climate crisis. I think we really need to be careful about going too far with removing regulations uh, for developers, because we might find development that doesn't really preserve that crucial balance in terms of neighborhood character um, and livability uh, within our city. Thank you. And now we're going to move to our closing statements. Uh, each candidate gets 60 seconds, and then we'll have time for you all to meet the candidates one-on-one -on -one if you wish. So we'll begin with Brian. Thanks, Fran. Uh, I would just close by saying that the, the privilege of serving this community on the city council is one that uh, many people probably can't imagine how gratifying it is. But as someone who came here to go to the University of Vermont almost 40 years ago, raised my family here, chose to live in the Old North End as a place where there's strong community, but where there's room for, um, for improvement really, is something that has been important to me personally. It's what has driven me to devote my life to this community. And uh, it's an incredible honor to, to be able to serve the people of Ward 3. And uh, I'm really grateful for that. All right, thank you. Max. So um, I absolutely love uh, the Old North End. This has been uh, just a, one of the great joys in my life, being su supporting and, and advocating for this neighborhood and uh, just showing up for this neighborhood. I absolutely love coming to community dinner every second Thursday in this room. I love uh, the ramble and volunteering for that wonderful community event. Um, it's just a, a joy to be a part of this neighborhood and have been able to get to know the people that make it what it is uh, and to support and advocate for them around issues that uh, directly impact their lives. So getting sidewalks fixed on Walnut Street Street or getting someone a recycling a covered recycling toter to prevent um, that windblown trash issue. Those kinds of basic things, making sure that we're really prioritizing neighborhood quality of life and, and serving um, our neighbors uh, and making sure that their needs are met is one of the, the things that I want to continue to prioritize while also um, making sure that we have our eye on some of these bigger policy issues around affordability, around sustainability, directly addressing the climate crisis in which we find ourselves, um, as well as trying to help folks to um, successfully age in place uh, in, 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 in Burlington for, for years to come. Thank you. And Ryan. I'd like to begin by thanking the AARP and BBA for hosting this event and all of you for showing up on what, such a lovely night. Um, I guess, you know, I've called Vermont home my entire life um, and the Old North End uh, for the past five and I just, I really love this neighborhood and I think it's incredibly special. Um, and 
Burlington, no matter what we do, is going to change within the next 10 years. Um, whether we like it or not, it's going to change. Um, and I really like to, would like to be a part of that change and advocate for the changes that my community and my neighborhood would like to see. Um, I think you know a lot of the problems that we've seen historically are still present at this day. Um, I worry that I won't be able to live here in the next five to ten years um, due to increased housing costs um, and just the cost of living in general. Uh, a lot of people both in my community and my friends, people I live next door to, have been priced out of this community and I would hate to see that continue to happen. All right. Ryan Nick, Max Tracy, Brian Pine. You guys are very lucky in this part of uh, Burlington to have such wonderful candidates and, and articulate, smart civil servants. Um, thank you all very much for being a part of this forum. So applause, and then I'll turn it over to Kelly. Really, very impressive. And now the, uh, the executive director of the Burlington Business Association, Kelly Devine. How about a, uh, a round of applause for our moderator, Fran Stoddard. She's done this for us a few times. Um, thank you all for coming out. I can't echo Councillor Pine's words enough that the city councilors uh, do serve an important role in the city. So uh, this is going to be recorded on CCTV so you can tell your neighbors if they want to check it out so you learn a little bit more about the candidates. The election is March 3rd. Um, and your polling places for this district are the Integrated Arts Academy, which is the polling place for Ward 2, and the Sustainability Academy, which is the polling place for Ward 3. So we ask folks to really turn out and vote this year and uh, make your voice be heard not only uh, for the candidates but for the uh, other ballot items that are on. Uh, it's always a pleasure to work with our friends at AARP. We share a lot of uh, similar commitments to Burlington. Uh, we're putting on four of these events. Tonight's the first one, uh, so if you're a real political junkie like me, you can keep coming out. Uh, tomorrow night we will be up in the Hill section uh, discussing wards one and eight at the YMCA. Uh, we did end up canceling our February 13th one in the South End due to lack of interest. Um, and then we will be down at the New North End at the Miller Center um, next week on the 19th for wards four and seven. Uh, we have some dessert available and um, uh, so feel free to stick around to that. Maybe you talk to the candidates. I also want to mention on the back of your flyer at the very bottom is some web links to where you can learn more about um, voting in Burlington. Burlington has same day registration, so we don't want to discourage anybody from showing up at the polls. You can find out where your ward is. So uh, I'll close by saying, uh, you know, our democracy really depends on people showing up and voting with their um, their right, voting their rights on election day. So please encourage your friends and neighbors to get out and vote. Thanks. <laughs>